And hello, everyone. Welcome to IRSS, the second session for the semester. We have the honor and the pleasure to host Professor Götz Neunek today. Professor Neunek is a senior research fellow at the Institute for uh, Friedensforschung und Sicherheitspolitik uh, and professor at the University of Hamburg. I'm sorry if I have butchered that. German is not one of my languages. He is an expert in arms control, disarmament, new technologies, nuclear weapons verification, science diplomacy, missile defense, space armament, cyber uh, security and space security, and military technology non-proliferation. From 2008 until 2018, he was the director of the postgraduate master's program, Peace and Security Studies at the University of Hamburg. He is the, a member of the Council of the Pogwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs. He is Pogwash representative um, of the VW, uh, VDW, spokesman for the Physics and Disarmament Working Group of the German Physical Society, DPG member of the editorial boards of specialist journals, representative of the Union of German Academies of Sciences, and an elected foreign member of the Russian and Armenian Academies of Sciences. After studying physics in Dusseldorf, wh where he uh, finished in 1984, he worked with Hornst Afheld, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, good, good, good. and <laughs> Karl Friedrich uh, von uh, Weitz, Weizsäcker yeah. <laughs> in the Max Planck Society. Uh, after receiving his doctorate in 1985 at the University of Hamburg, he became a research assistant at IFSH under Egon Barr. His talk for today is titled Nuclear Verification in the Context of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty and the Treaty Prohibiting Nuclear Weapons, so the NPT and the TPN, TPNW. Um, Professor Neunek, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Eliza, for your introduction, your kind words. Uh, so you could imagine how complicated it is for a non-native speaker to, to, to speak in a foreign language. And uh, I, I appreciate that you at least try to use, uh, to pronounce it correctly. Uh, it would be the same if I had to talk some words in, in Turkish. So nevertheless, uh, thank you. And I, I am happy to, to, to look back to the time where Eliza was in our institute. Um, um, so greetings to, to, to Ankara and to all of you would be of course more stimulating and, and intense to meet you in person. So uh, COVID, um, obliges us to, to, to use that format, which has also some, some advantages as always. Technology has advantages, it has also disadvantages. So uh, we will not really meet in, in person with the exception of Eliza and, and uh, Mr. Guler. Uh, I even do not know how to pronounce his name. So Mehmet, uh, who also uh, I had uh, the nice time to discuss important issues about energy, nuclear energy, and, and I'm happy that, that he and also all of you uh, are succeeding with your studies. Um, I, I, I'm aware that you mostly talk about theories of international relations and um, uh, physics, physics, physics doesn't have the problem uh, because their theories are quite different from those in the social sciences. But uh, at the end, uh, we all live in the same world uh, and a nuclear bomb is a nuclear bomb. Uh, the only difference is it was built by physicists and um, that was under war conditions. So the political situation was quite different to those of today. And I think uh, several of, 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 of our ancestors uh, uh, and, and people uh, tried to, to change the course so that nuclear weapons, uh, which have been invented, uh, but will never be used. Uh, and that's, that's an internal challenge somewhat. Um, my subject today is verification. You know that the argument always is that um, treaties are fine, but if they can't be verified, that they are very useless. So uh, that was also one of the arguments by Mr. Trump and others so that he, he skipped uh, important treaties like the INF treaty 
uh, or the Open Skies Treaty, which is actually actually on verification. And um, uh, I think this is certainly a big pro political problem that many people are no longer really um, uh, trusting arms control to 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 uh, non-proliferation disarmament to to lead the way. And uh, during the Cold War, the situation was quite different, although much more dangerous than today. Unfortunately, we still have too much nuclear weapons left. So the situation is still very dangerous, uh, might be uh, a low risk, but the problem is the risk is a multiplication of two factors. One is the damage, which is huge, incredibly huge, could more or less destroy the whole planet. Uh, several even hundreds of nuclear weapons. Um, the, uh, the probability that this happens might be quite low, but the multiplication is quite high, so the risk is high. And even if it doesn't happen today, it might happen one day, and we will certainly not uh, shift to the doctrinal and other issues, so I'm concentrating on verification. And I think the there have been some remarkable, remarkable steps forward, which are unnoticed uh, by the public. Um, I wanted to use here, of course, my transparencies. I hope you can see the PDF version of it. Um, it's okay, right. And I wanted to make uh, three steps. Uh, what is disarmament? Uh, that's not so easy to answer. <laughs> Every man might be might say, "Okay, just reducing nuclear war it is fine, uh, but uh, what is it really, and how to verify disarmament?" Um, it's it's a tough question. You will see hopefully after the talk, but it, you will also see that there are methods, also given political will uh, and uh, especially technologies which really can help to build high confidence that disarmament is really. Uh, uh, taking part. The second is, of course, an object for of many studies over the years. Non, the Non-Proliferation Treaty from 1968 came into force in 1970 and is the cornerstone of nuclear um, non-proliferation and arms control. Uh, with many states being member of it, uh, not all of them. You know that this is a a somewhat discriminate treaty because you have three groups of states. One are the non-nuclear weapon states, uh, which um, uh, have the right for peaceful use of nuclear energy, but cannot and should not and uh, are not allowed to, allowed to build nuclear weapons. Uh, 184 states, states, which is a huge number of states and international relations. And uh, then you have, of course, the privileges of five uh, so-called classical traditional nuclear weapon states, US and Russia, then China, France, and Great Britain. This is the second category. And then there are four nuclear armed states remaining out of the regime. The treaty is the core of a regime. There are other related groups, like such as the nuclear suppliers group, and uh, this uh, uh, treaty is always reviewed every five years. Uh, the next uh, review conference hopefully might uh, be in, 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 in August uh, uh, this year. But then uh, you might also be aware of that. Um, the, the ignorance of the nuclear weapon states um, helped to create a treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons, which is uh, quite new an undiscriminate um, treaty, uh, which is now in force since January 22nd, and uh, more and more states are signing to it. And there's, of course, a debate, what is the future? Uh, the opponents say the TPNW might destroy the non-proliferation treaty. The, uh, the ban treaty people, uh, proponents say, uh, no, this is a uh, complementary. Um, treaty, so we will we might dive in this discussion uh, later on, and then there are a lot of uh, technical aspects which we might touch um, uh, a little bit at least at, at the end, so that you got a uh, sense 
how specific initiatives uh, are um, continuing their work. There's an acronym which you might not understand, IPNDV. NDV is somewhat a general acronym for nuclear disarmament verification. Okay, and IP means International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification. I, I come to that in, 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 in a minute. Um, of course, the um, way forward is to go into the direction of the world free of nuclear weapons. You know the statistics, it, uh, its peak was in around 1987 with all aggregated Russian and American um, stockpile numbers of warheads. Um, and this number, the red one for Russia and the blue one for the US is going down, which is good. But if you look on the bottom, uh, then you will see that we still have, um, and these are uh, strategic nuclear weapons, there are others, tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, we have these also in Britain, China, France, India, Israel, North Korea, and Pakistan. The last four are the uh, four states which are not members of the N NPT. So the good news is the number is going down. Uh, we are beyond the peak, but the bad news is there are still too many of them uh, in operation, active, and can be used uh, in, in half an hour or so. Um, uh, but the remaining part of the stockpile is still there, although it's not longer operational, but in terms of fissile material, in terms of reserve and passive warheads, most of this peak is still there and uh, for even for Russia and the US, which comprises 95% of all nuclear weapons in the world, it's hard work to uh, reduce and to dismantle them. And uh, the next slide shows a little bit more of the details. Russia and the US have other elephants in the room. They have most of, of all nuclear weapons. So if you add them, you have around 13, 12,000, 13,000. And they have different categories. They have deployed ones, which are more or less um, part of the limitation is, is, is thanks to the new START treaty, which is now expired for, for five years. But then there are also stockpiled warheads and there are retired warheads. And um, no one really knows how this dismantled process is really continuing. If you have so many nuclear weapons, it might not be important whether you have dismantled per year 100 or 50 nuclear warheads. But if you're going down with the numbers, it is utmost important to have confidence that these warheads are really dismantled. dismantled. And we can, of course, make the same discussions for France, China, and UK. Um, they are building up the arsenal, at least in Pakistan and India, Israel, not much is, is known about that and uh, DPRK is a subject by itself. So how to, to dismantle this? Uh, and what is dis disarmament? And if you think about it, you will find several paths of discussion. One is, it's simply a reduction. So if you, you reduce under new start warheads, uh, or you, you, you limit them, then this is a reduction of warheads. But what's about redeployment? If the stuff, the fissile material is still there, it can be uh, uploaded again, it can be put again on warheads and on delivery systems. So that's a weak disarmament in a sense, and it's at least reversible. It's not irre irreversible. And it's mostly done in a non-transparent way. Numbers are published, but what does MUM numbers really mean if it comes to only one nuclear weapon which can blow up a city? And uh, what happens with the fissile material? Then we have the notion of denuclearization, which you always find if you talk about North Korea. But what does that mean? Um, does it include commercial nuclear energy? What is with the uh, w existing warheads? How many are there? This is still uh, unknown in, in, in the case of North Korea. Then uh, we have the notion of dismantlement of nuclear warheads, and that has never been done under international control. So this is really a paradigm shift. If not only that, we not only talk about delivery systems, missiles, ICBMs, and that kind of stuff, but also about nuclear warheads. And how do you dismantle 
the, these warheads because you have a technical problem. As long as the NPT is uh, uh, valid, uh, you cannot show the, um, the uh, mechanism, the details of a nuclear warhead to others because that would be uh, not allowed by Article 1 and 2 of the NPT. Uh, so how can you dismantle something which you do not know and how can you be can you assure that the nuclear this is really a nuclear warhead and that a nuclear warhead has been dismantled uh, this is a, a tough question and then we can also talk about nuclear doctrines but no first use for example is a typical subject uh, how how um, valid is deterrence how stable is it and so on and so on I leave that, but these are different aspects of nuclear disarmament. And what are the current initiatives? One is, of course, New Start. Um, it's it's a really a big, an, an important step forward that the, this treaty was not uh, destroyed by the attempts of the uh, former administration, uh, the US administration, to kill all arms control treaties. Uh, that survived, and now US and Russia have five years to talk uh, about the problems which exist uh, on the field, and this is a, a huge uh, problem. If you include now missile, ballistic missile defense, cyber attacks, um, conventional uh, warheads, uh, which are on delivery systems, on, on nuclear delivery systems, precision guided weapons and that kind of stuff. But at least we have uh, now five years which can be used for a useful dialogue. Although the dialogue between the US and Russia on this uh, field didn't work for the last years. Uh, the reason is of course modernization on different aspects, hypersonic weapons, ballistic missile defense and all that kind of stuff. So the non-proliferation treaty is still there which is uh, important and good, uh, uh, but we have a disarmament uh, um, obligation under Article 6, uh, which is more or less, in my view, violated because it's not moving forward here. Uh, we can come to a discussion about it uh, later on. Then we should not forget that the NPT is related to nuclear weapon-free zones. So most of the countries in uh, the Southern Hemisphere are already free of nuclear weapons in the sense that they don't possess them, Latin America, Africa, South Pacific. And then we have now this emerging treaty on the provision of nuclear weapons. We will talk about that. Then we have this international partnership for disarmament verification, where I can give you some more insight in the last part of my talk. And uh, then there have been also lukewarm attempts by the Trump administration to, to, to talk at least about disarmament. They call that creating the environment for nuclear disarmament, which is of course an eddy by, by saying we cannot disarm for the moment, but we are ready to create about uh, the uh, clearing the environment of it. We will see how the Biden administration reacts on this kind of initiative, whether they wanted to continue this uh, with some more impact. And this is also, of course, true for IPNDV. Even here, uh, I think a review of the new government uh, would be helpful to bring in some more uh, ideas on these issues. Um, so I already said that nuclear disarmament is, in a sense, only bilateral actually, between the US and Russia. And both sides have high confidence that the delivery systems, that means ICBMs, SLBMs, are dismantled. And there's also some plausibility that the warheads on these ICBMs are also gone. But this is not done uh, by independent inspectors. It's the, done under the observation surveillance of uh, Russian or American inspectors, which is a huge step forward. To have 10 inspections per year means that Russian military visits American uh, facilities and the other way around. And this is high confidence building. And this will happen in the next five years again. And it's 
perhaps also important to understand that both sides still uh, do not accuse each other to violate the treaty. You remember that uh, this is not the case with the INF treaty. It's not the case with the Iran uh, uh, um, deal, uh, JCPOA. Here we have a lot of accusations from, from both sides whoever the both sides are to violate the treaty. Um, then there is no verification of the dismantlement itself. This is fully in the hands of the, the owner state. And then the, the question emerges, what happens with the components, with the fissile material? Uh, that is somewhat unclear. So a new dismantlement process, which might become one day as part of nuclear disarmament would mean that you have inspectors who verify uh, the dismantlement and the destruction uh, of uh, further nuclear reductions, which only can mean the reduction of nuclear warheads. And um, I can assure you, and might give you some details uh, thereafter, that the dismantlement of only one nuclear warhead is a very complex, technical, challenging, and costly thing. Uh, but one can also argue if that happened once, it could also be much easier for all other nuclear warheads later on. And uh, it is important to understand that as long as you do this dismantlement uh, under the framework of the NPT, you have to also not only um, put a nuclear warhead apart, but you also have to protect the proliferation sensitive information. And this is one of the arguments why the nuclear weapon states argue that cannot be done uh, in the public. Uh, let's say it cannot be done by IAEA, it cannot uh, be done actually because these are, this includes the dismantlement of a warhead, is, includes the most uh, protected uh, national secrets on nuclear weapons, and that is somewhat true. So we have to find ways uh, how to handle that without violating the uh, NPT. And um, so what is verification? Um, I would define this as a iterative and deliberative policy process of using collected data to assess whether a state party is in compliance with the provisions of an international treaty. You can only do verification if you have a treaty and if both or more members agree on it. Otherwise, I would not call it verification. Um, then in the context of North Korea, you always have seen if you have written documents on the whole procedure that uh, denuclearization should be verifiable, irreversible and transparent which is a high requirement to the North Koreans, which try to, to, to uh, shy away from, from that. But this is also true for verification. If you really want to do that, and process has to be verifiable, it has to be irreversible. You have to be sure that if you dismantle a warhead, that it cannot rebuild again, okay? And if you include inspectors, uh, then, you must on one side be sure that the secrets are not proliferating on the one side, but the inspectors must be confident that this is really a warhead and that you really wanted to uh, not to rebuild that again. So it means needs, verification needs declarations. It means protocols, it means training. It, you, you have to, to exercise that and you need technologies. And these technologies have to be accepted by all sides. So this is a very complex process for, for good is that we have already a lot of experiences with verification, but most of it uh, was under IAEA, especially in the case of Iran and Iraq. We have uh, not only one big agency for verification pur pur purposes, the IAEA, in the, the case of chemical weapons, we have the, um, the OPCW, uh, we have the, auto, the Open S um, S um, Skies Treaty, where airplanes have, are used to overfly adversary area, 
one must say. And then we have also the, con the Conventional Forces in Europe uh, Treaty, which is suspended. But uh, uh, this treaty allows a lot of very detailed visits and uh, verification uh, pro protocols and pro procedures. And thousands of inspections have been made. So the, the, um, the lessons learned here are huge. And that is, I think, uh, something which also future verification can rely on, although the, uh, there are significant differences. So I would say disarmament. What is disarmament? It's a concrete and verifiable irre 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 irreversible reduction, the dismantlement, the destruction, and the, at the end, the elimination of nuclear weapons from a national military nuclear arsenal. And that should be done in an irreversible way. It should not, should not contribute to non-proliferation. And it should also require that uh, inspectors uh, are still safe. You know, this is radioactive material here and uh, secure could be uh, uh, object of nuclear terrorism, for example. So you have to maintain security. And if that is done on an operational basis of a still nuclear weapon state, then you also have to include the operations. What does the non proliferation Treaty says under Article 6? Uh, you know this uh, um, um, very weak word. It says each party undertakes to pursue negotiations in good faith on effective measures relating to the cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date and to nuclear disarmament and on a treaty on general and complete disarmament under strict effective international control. Um, again, this is a weak um, obligation, but it's no longer really uh, accepted in a sense that the nuclear weapon states do not negotiate any longer and they are also not working on uh, for for um, procedures under strict and interne international control with the exception of the IAEA which has only a mandate to verify by safeguards safeguard agreements between different states uh, the peaceful use of nuclear energy uh, so the IAEA would have the expertise to do much more on verification, but the word you would hardly find really in documents. It's always, we always talk on the basis of special agreements. One of them is the additional protocol about safeguards, which means inspection of specific declared facilities, reprocessing or enrichment facilities, but also do accounting on the fissile materials. And that gives a higher confidence that a state is not uh, uh, conducting some clandestine programs. Uh, Iran is a good example that there's still a lot of inspections going on in Iran. So Iran in the last 10 years is may, may be the most inspected country in the world, nevertheless, is still a subject whether Iran builds up at least a facility or a uh, is is hiding material or is still again producing material. So you you see how complicated it is to verify on one side and on the other side to make really sure that the treaty is not violated. The treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons is now in force. It uh, is a for me, first, a uh, treaty based on international humanitarian law, which uh, says not to, to uh, uh, undertake under any circumstances to develop, test, produce, manufacture, acquire, possess, uh, and use uh, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, and the treaty under Article 4 says if a country becomes a member of the, this treaty, then uh, it has to ver verifiably in a time-bound manner and in a transparent manner uh, have to, to show that its nuclear stockpile has been dismantled. Um, critics say this is not elaborated uh, within the framework of the treaty, which is true. 
And the argument is simply it's at first a humanitarian uh, law uh, treaty, but it, the treaty has some success by that it is signed by, by many states, 122, that it is now in force. The problem is, of course, that no, that non-nuclear weapon states and NATO members did not participate, neither in the negotiations, with the exception, exception of the Netherlands, uh, and, and could not uh, be part of the treaty. Uh, and we have to be fair, they do not really uh, accept the treaty. So there's a big tension between the proponents of the treaty and the opponents. Um, the next slide shows you the pros and cons. And I've first, uh, five points about the pros. It is the first ever multilateral UN treaty on the global elimination of nuclear weapons. So I think that is for, for many and most populations and people of the world, a big step forward. Um, I'm quoting here the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, I think it formalizes the taboo of a nuclear weapon use. Nuclear weapons only have been used one or two times, uh, including a lot of nuclear tests later on. Uh, but uh, it somewhat delegitimizes nuclear weapons. Um, I think if it handled carefully, it can trigger a new phase about a debate on outlawing nuclear weapons. And the nuclear weapon states are somewhat in, under pressure by this treaty. Uh, let's be honest. Uh, and that, that is also beyond the humanitarian uh, law argument uh, and one of the arguments that this treaty might become also one day a disarmament treaty. The proponents say the NPT and the uh, ban treaty are complementary. The opponents say now uh, the uh, ban treaty could weaken the NPT. Uh, everyone who is interested in that, I can point to a study just uh, published by the German parliament uh, scientific service, who says that the treaty do not contradict each other, uh, which is remarkable because some parties in Germany say that these treaties are, uh, the, the, the Ben Treaty is, is very bad for the NPT, including parts of the government say that. Um, so what, what do the uh, critics say? They say no disarmament treaty, this is not a disarmament treaty, and this is true. Uh, as long as there is not one state who disarms fully and becomes a member of the treaty, there is no disarmament effect here. Um, the verification proce procedures are not elaborated, which is somewhat true, but it would be too much for such a treaty to, to, to discuss all aspects here. Um, then, then the, the um, opponents are, are heavy. I mean, uh, these are nine nuclear powers, uh, not only the five, big five one, which articulate a lot of criticism about the Ben Treaty, but also 27 non-nuclear weapon states, which are come from J uh, NATO, but also states like Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia. And if you, if you add all the GDP of all these uh, states, then you will see, that they comprises about 80% uh, of all GDP. So these are the po very powerful states. Um, and there's not much leverage against the uh, nuclear weapon state owners, uh, but there's of course some leverage, uh, moral pressure, um, uh, capital uh, investment, um, and a lot of arguments by, by um, NGOs, which, which make quite, good arguments for further nuclear disarmament. We can, I talked about, uh, already a little bit about what are the verification slash safeguard requirements of the NPT. And um, um, with, with the help of the IAA safeguards and the additional protocol, you could have a high confidence that many states which run nuclear reactors do not use these or other facilities for building nuclear weapons. Although we have uh, controversies, for example, about Iran. So what would be the verification requirements of the ban treaty? 
And I, I think the Ben Treaty um, needs uh, three steps if a nuclear armed state becomes a member of the uh, Ben Treaty. So he, he or she has to give up all their nuclear facilities, all their nuclear warheads, which might be uh, easy, easier for a small state, uh, let's say like uh, Brazil or, well, Brazil is not small, uh, so small only meant in a territorial sense, or Argentine, uh, you know that both states are, uh, have a special agreement. They, they once gave up nuclear weapons and um, they never had a nuclear or only a small nuclear inventory. Uh, but for a full-fledged nuclear armed state uh, uh, becoming member of the TPNW, that would mean to eliminate the nuclear inventory. And that, that might be easy, let's say in the case of North Korea, which has maybe only six warheads, but we don't know actually, by the way, uh, it would be much more complicated for a state like uh, Russia or, United, or the United States, of course. Uh, I don't speak about the likelihood of, of that this happens, but we have also to face that as a technical uh, uh, problem, not only as a political problem. So then the uh, nuclear weapon facilities have to be converted to peaceful use. Uh, all nuclear weapon armed states have special facilities where they produce uh, their materials and you have to, to convert them in an irreversible way. And that would also include, of course, IAEA relevant facilities. So you see it's an, there's also an overlap here between the IAEA safeguard world and the Ben Treaty. And then you have to make sure uh, for the future that such a state which once had all the knowledge and the fissile materials and the nuclear weapons itself and uh, if the state has given up, it would be fine. But I'll make you sure that a state never again produces nuclear weapons. The political environment might change. A state might feel threatened. And some new heads of state might, might uh, uh, argue that they need, again, nuclear weapons. So how to make that sure? There has been debates about that. Keywords are here, social um societal verification or or uh, nuclear ecology i i don't have the time to go into details so uh, a ban treaty stipulates that these undertakings will and can be verified to confirm that nuclear weapon state parties uh, are really fulfilling their treaty obligations and again i said that overlaps with the uh, uh, existing uh, safeguard agreements, but also with a future fissile material cutoff, which is also quite unlikely for the moment. But uh, if you have dismantled the war, you, you have a lot of fissile material, weapon relevant material, and what to do with that. And uh, one of the um, proposals here is to go into um, uh, a new regime. Um, always important is to have a baseline declaration about the um, full uh, inventory and the facilities which are relevant for nuclear weapon purposes, which is a very tricky thing. Uh, I, ne I never faced that problem until the moment when I, 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 I became part of IPNDV, how complicated that is. But you can exercise uh, uh, thought uh, experiment by thinking a little bit about North Korea that until today North Korea uh, rejected to give any declaration what they really have you know and this is always where the problem also also the political problem really uh, starts and but let's assume that you have a baseline declaration you have to verify that and even that itself is a problem especially in a big country a smaller country might be easier, but uh, even a smaller country uh, might have a lot of uh, secret uh, caves, facilities, military uh, objects where a state would all, always not allow uh, to, to, to in, in invite inspectors. So in a sense, uh, TPNW inspectors must have access to at least all nuclear related uh, 
facilities and even to clandestine locations under the additional protocol, uh, this is uh, a possibility. But if you look to the Iran case, then you see how complicated it is to really to do that. And if you include things like mines, uh, conversion facilities, which are also partially related to the nuclear weapon fuel cycle, you know, where Article 4 clearly says that a state uh, has the right to, uh, to run these facilities. So in a sense, a, a new ban treaty needs an independent verification uh, regime. Um, I see uh, my time is also a little bit running out, so I'm going a little bit faster, but the, the next transparencies are for those who are much more interested into details. Uh, there have been already initiatives to study a verification of the dismantlement of nuclear warheads. I only wanted to mention the so-called trilateral in initiative between the US, Russian Federation and, and EIA, IAEA. There were uh, special projects between the UK and the US, nuclear weapon state. Then the first project between a Web, nuclear weapon state, the UK and Norway, non-nuclear weapon states, where they try to simulate the dismantlement of one fake warhead. And then there are other initiatives, more exercises going on, more uh, um, projects, including uh, uh, also non-nuclear weapon states. So for example, Sweden was invited for this Quad initiative and then the IPNDV, International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification, has now 25 states, including five nuclear weapon states, discussing verification uh, protocols. Then we had in, in 2019 an exercise together with our French colleagues uh, called New Dive. Um, and then uh, because IPNDV only focuses on 25 states, which are more or less states which are allies somewhat of the United States. Um, China and Russia took part in the first part, but never, never come back. So there are strong uh, efforts going on to include all others, uh, not only the UK, France and the US in this IPNDV exercise, which I think would be a very important step forward if all nuclear weapon states would be on the table. At least they are on the table in Geneva at a UN group of governmental experts, which also discusses um, concepts, how to verify the, the different problems I just uh, presented to you. Uh, IPNDV, you see here, uh, the 25 states uh, not only includes the Western nuclear weapon states, uh, but also Turkey, uh, Germany, uh, Finland, the European Union. Um, I don't really have the time to, to go too much into this initiative. It has uh, uh, three uh, phases. Uh, it has different working groups. Um, this is not on politics, it's mostly on monitoring uh, verification objectives, uh, how to organize an on-site inspection, what are the technical challenges, are there technical solutions, and you see um, here in these different phases, uh, meetings every three months, actually we are in phase three and uh, the, work, the, the, the work becomes much harder now, you know, you can you can do a lot with Zoom, but the, the personal exchange is, is, is much more important in, in this endeavor here. Um, this is uh, for all those who are interested, a uh, quite interesting diagram. And there was a lot of talk uh, and, and knowledge uh, to put in that. What would be the full dismantlement cycle, you know? And uh, we um, separated and identified several steps, one to 14 from uh, the um, uh, separation of a nuclear warhead at a facility, operational facility, to the transport, uh, to bringing the warhead into the storage, uh, to start dismantling under six. So the, the middle uh, uh, row shows you the dismantlement uh, uh, facility scenario 
uh, bring the weapon from the storage to the dismantlement facility and um, then bring at the end the um, different components into storages again. And the colors uh, always show where you need inspections, where you need a perfect chain of custody, especially also measurements. You cannot do measurements all the time. So you need uh, to have special points uh, for measurements. Uh, you are uh, um, indicated here with different colors. So this is for those who, who wanted to study it. I mean, I, we, we can discuss that in, in later on. Um, this, these are some pictures of, of different initiatives. So this is always a group of uh, uh, 25 to 30 knowledgeable people. You, you see here uh, a mock-up warhead. This uh, first picture shows you Odin, which is a faked nuclear bomb <laughs> with a little bit of nuclear material in it. And the team, uh, the inspectors, uh, the red team, and the uh, inspectees in different colors. You see here the Quad Initiative, uh, which uh, showed um, also different um, uh, inspectors in white, black, and green, and a warhead, uh, which is a little bit more realistic than the warhead we see uh, for the U UK Norway Initiative. Um, this is about the uh, German-French exercise or so rooms with containers, with surveillance cameras, um, measurements, handheld measurements to, to assure that this is radioactive material in its special seals in it. So uh, that, that's a very complex thing, uh, I can assure you. I don't have the time to go into that. Many people might be relieved uh, that I won't do it. This is an original photo of a B-61 uh, Mod 2 bomb. And you see, uh, and we, o we only see the surface, not the details, that you have a lot of material here uh, and, and what to do with the material, uh, um, how to handle it and uh, who, who could handle it. Um, I'm, you know, because my time is really running out, I'm skipping a lot of measurement issues. Um, he, you can measure plutonium, for example, you have special peaks, but uh, as an inspector, you are not allowed to understand, to understand the full details of plutonium. So you, because of article one and two of the NPT uh, treaty, uh, so you, you have to build special so-called information barriers so that you protect on one side, proliferation sensitive information, but to make sure on the other side to, to authentify the warhead so that you really know that it is a warhead. Uh, the, the, these are things physicists love to discuss uh, and to, to, to develop, but these materials and these equipment already exists. Okay, so then special exercises have been made for, for dismantlement. How, how would a dismantlement facility look like? No one really thought much about it. There are diagrams, uh, uh, for example, here uh, designed by the Japanese colleagues. So we have a remarkable sharing of, uh, of work for our very detailed uh, uh, preparations for all these exercises. And uh, the Japanese try to, 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 to design a special room where only the inspectors in the middle are allowed to, to dismantle the warhead, but where other inspectors can be sure that not uh, any material is diverted here. Uh, that's, that's a big challenge. Okay, so um, you can of course use for the chain of custody special identifiers, which have been developed uh, by the IAEA. Um, you can do measurements with infrared, X-ray, gamma, neutron detection. We have uh, several dissertations uh, going on in Hamburg on that. Uh, here are some results. I, I don't want to give you, go into detail. Uh, what are the results of IPNDV? That was one of the results of the phase one. And um, I think it's remarkable um, at the end because IPNDV is a trust and confidence building exercise itself. 
because people from the labs, from the nuclear weapon labs, speak with military people, diplomats, and scientists uh, from other states, nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. And uh, for me as a physicist, it's easy to, 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 to explain how easy it is to dismantle a warhead. And a student of international relations might say, yeah, okay, if the state is willing to do that, it's easy to do. But in fact, it's not easy to do. And um, there are always constraints by states. And um, it's quite good to have uh, different people sitting together and, and working on common uh, protocols and, and inspections. So I, I leave it with that and come to some, some conclusions, um, simply to, to argue that nuclear disarmament and verification is a complex enterprise, especially if you really wanted to dismantle and destroy a nuclear warhead. And that is a very serious thing. And it has to be part of a nuclear future reduction treaty. That treaty, not necessary, has to be in a treaty between um, based on the Ban Treaty, it could be also a treaty between the US and Russia on the dismantlement of um, INF type systems or of specific warheads. And although the discussions between uh, the Trump administration and, 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 and Putin's uh, government um, was not very successful, at least on the table is a proposal to make a cap on the existing nuclear warheads, uh, strategic as well as tactical. And um, that's easy to be said, but how can you verify that? I mean, uh, we, we're listening to, to eminent um, diplomats, uh, whether they are from the Republican or especially from Democrats like Rose Gotemüller, but, um, it's easy to say we need uh, a cap uh, and a freeze on nuclear warheads, but how to verify it? I mean, it's, it's, it could be a treaty and could be a protocol. And uh, there are different ways forward between the US and Russia, uh, how to continue. And um, you need, of course, always to have key principles. I told you about protecting the sensitive information for non-proliferation purposes, there are special, specific disarmament obligations, safety and security plays a role. So these are very important principles here, which you, can, you cannot throw away, uh, even not in a, a ban treaty like a uh, verification regime. Uh, there are technologies available, uh, but technology does not solve everything. Uh, it's, there's also a tendency of scientists to say, you know, I have a detector here, or I have a encryption uh, technology there. But uh, if you wanted to implement that, it's, it's not, not easy, but these technologies exist. And that's, that's a positive uh, message here. Um, I think uh, to be a little bit more uh, realistic and concrete, I think for the NPT, a way forward would be if uh, the P5 would start discussing seriously verification, monitoring, and dismantlement. Uh, you, you might know that during the NPT review conferences, there's always a statement of the five nuclear weapon states. And uh, they, they are also, there's also a series of P5 meetings, but they are quite um, secretive and uh, not very clear of what they are talking about. Of course, there's a big asymmetry on one side, the US and Russia have <laughs> too many, and the others are very reluctant to even use the word or the word a reduction treaty. Um, it's also hopefully came clear during my uh, talk that a if a nuclear weapon state enters the uh, TPNW, then there are three key phases, which in itself are complex. One is to have a baseline declaration for the nuclear inventory and a specific, invita uh, specific uh, verification regime, especially for making sure that the nuclear inventory is gone. You know, and uh, then the second is the uh, irreversible conversion of the nuclear weapon related facilities uh, so that the state can no longer produce nuclear weapon material. And then at the end, uh, if even if, if if a state has zero nuclear weapons and facilities, or at least has some facilities only for 
uh, civil uh, nuclear energy, then at the end, uh, you must make sure in a world free of nuclear weapons that this state is not returning to produce nuclear weapons. And uh, that's also a big challenge. We are uh, far away from this, but uh, as you have might learned, uh, there are a lot of good um, and, and serious um, exercises and, and, and meetings going on to, uh, to elaborate useful verification uh, purposes. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced for all of those who are uh, fervent proponents of the Ban Treaty, um, that also this community has to work much more on verification because this is one of the big key remaining gaps of the treaty to make sure that this work verification uh, really works in an efficient way and in a way that a state who is ready to give up nuclear weapons trust uh, the whole regime. So it's again not easy to be done, but this is a huge um, uh, challenge and enterprise for the future. And sorry for speaking so long, but if we if we subtract the uh, uh, the introduction, then I was more or less <laughs> in forty five minutes. So sorry. I hope, I hope it was not too boring for you. Not at all. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Neuner. Would you mind? Uh, if we now go to the normal view, so uh, would yes. it be okay for you if we stop sharing? Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to see the faces here. It's one of the bis, big uh, gaps here in the Zoom conferences that you don't see really the people. So I'm happy to see especially those who uh, uh, raise questions or with, with whom we can come to a, a more intense uh, Q&A. That would be great. Um, so I'm going to switch to speaker view. So whoever is going to uh, make a question or a comment uh, can be the focus of the, of the screen. I would also like to mention the fact that um, some of our students may have to go earlier than planned uh, because they have they have class. Lunch break is usually the only sure. time they're all available. But there's still there's still plenty of people left. So I actually have a couple of hands up. Um, Professor Nainek, do you want to take a couple? Uh, so we'll take them maybe one by one. Right now, I have Chatai who would like to ask a question. Okay, go ahead, Chatai. Can you hear me? Yeah. Professor Nainek, yeah. First of all, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and, and for the illuminating speech. It's truly really a pleasure to see you again and have you the speaker here. So as we understand, MPT is the centerpiece for with regard to non-proliferation efforts, and IAEA is the is the central authority for the verification of the fulfillment of of MPT treaty. So it is often claimed by the Iranian Iranian uh, authorities that Tehran has been uh, committed to the obligation under born under this treaty, and you also said. They are like under 10 years on the really serious inspection. So in this respect, I have two questions regarding this issue. I mean, my, the first one will be, has IAEA uh, verified anything regarding the, that indicates Iranian, Iran's commitment to the MPT? And how far do we know uh, about the reference in terms of non-proliferation? And the second one is related to first one, uh, so how do we see the Trump administration's uh, withdrawal from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action? And what do you expect from the Biden administration in this subject, in this issue? Thank you very much. Okay, so I mean, this is, this is um, a very actual and, 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 and important question. And um, um, I think, um, Pugwash and some of its um, national groups were, were quite included, especially since 2004 in the dialogue between Iran and uh, the rest of the world on these issues. And we were quite uh, happy to learn in 2015 
that uh, with the help of, of other countries, this agreement was signed. Um, the Trump administration decided to, 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 to throw it away and um, the, the argumentation was not so much about, of course, uh, the government said Iran was violating it. Um, IAEA made a tremendous job and you can read uh, all the uh, um, leaked uh, 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 reports about these different verification um, uh, efforts, uh, had a very complete, I would say 90% complete picture about the situation in 2015, especially on the production of the material, but also about the um, uh, work uh, Iran was uh, conducting uh, prior to 2003, and this is a so-called military dimension. Um, of course, there have been um, arguments about that from Israel, uh, and in, in a secret operation, uh, Israel uh, found a lot of material. Uh, but uh, the international community and also, also including all physicists were quite convinced that Iran 2015 has given up its nuclear weapon program and uh, it has a program it has had it has had a program no no doubt about it but if you if you listen to to the Iranians that has much to do with Iraq at that time and then the war came and uh, I think not many people really felt really um, necessary to have such a program. So they gave it up. The question is, did they really reveal 100%? And I think studying the IAE efforts, uh, no, no one really was absolutely sure. So they, they might be still knowledge in the country, but there's also knowledge in Germany about nuclear weapons in other countries. <laughs> And I don't want it to raise the question, what is going on in Turkey? I, I don't know. I simply don't know, but I would say it's plausible if some people and in all these countries, you know, in all these important countries which are in conflict relations, there are people who say we need nuclear weapons. Okay. And um, of course, we in Turkey, we had a special debate as well in Germany about NATO and uh, extended deterrence and all that kind of stuff but there are people uh, in all countries who have knowledge so if we, we can for a long time discuss uh, how serious the program was and whether it can be reactivated um, might be but the 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 fuses uh, in the iran um, uh, the obligations in the iran deal were quite strong and we gave up uh, or the iran gave up a huge amount of material uh, and, and that was transported out of the country. And uh, the, the remaining part really reduces the outbreak uh, or extended the outbreak time. Uh, so it's, it's still a question, uh, also in domestic question in Iran, there are people and forces which wanted to build a nuclear weapon. Uh, and the arguments are, are very close to North Korean arguments and other countries which say, you know, we are threatened. So the only way how to, to, to be not uh, uh, attackable <laughs> is to have nuclear weapons. And um, I think uh, IAEA uh, produce, had a, a great insight in the program and also in the existing program. And that was a big, big step forward. M most of the stuff we are talking about, about the centrifuges, even the older facilities, the material under protection of the IAE, by the way, and so on and so on, so on came from this uh, very long time inspections under the accepted additional protocol. And, and, and although Iran has not really signed out signed on the additional protocol at the end, it accepted the additional protocol. And it is always the key debate here in diplomatic talks, how serious the additional protocol is really um, uh, accepted, is it accepted? And there are diplomats saying, you know, we have the parliament in Iran, and there are others, and so on and so on. So at the end of the day, to make it shorter, 
we have in June elections in in Iran, and then the question will be: Do the uh, the nuclear weapon proponents and the conservatives come back to power or not? And they actually, uh, uh, Mr. Zarif, tries to come back to to uh, uh, the uh, obligations under the Iran uh, deal, the GCPOA, and they say we Iran is is accepting it at the moment. It is jumping over the line by saying we're producing more, we have new modern centrifuges, so the breakout time is actually decreasing. And, and especially by arguing, we are, do experiments with metal, metallic um, uh, materials, shows that they could reactivate the nuclear weapon program. And this will exactly happen if, if the conservatives, conservatives are, real, uh, are elected again. I'm quite sure about that, that they would also be happy to destroy JCPOA. So the Biden administration has a problem here, but until now, it, the government, uh, which has a lot of other problems, by the way, uh, and it, it uh, heritage it from Trump and the destruction work Trump has done with the agreement, you don't for, should not forget that the EU tried to bridge the gap here between the United States, which is no longer a member, and um, uh, Iran. So it would be a step forward if first, US becomes a member. Second, that uh, the basis of it is only and only JCPOA and the Iran agreement and uh, that not other issues are mixed and linked to that. Of course, there is a link to the missile program. There is also a link to politics in the region um, Syria, uh, support for different terrorist groups, and so on and so on. But everyone who is a little bit uh, uh, has insight into Iran's domestic affairs knows that there are several people who are happy to destroy JCPOA in general. And that would be a very dangerous move because then we would have again voices simply saying we have to bomb them. If these facilities are bombed, at least the known facilities, by the way, known by IAE efforts, of course, uh, secret services also play a role here, but at least we have a complete picture, a 90 or 95% complete picture about Iran. But if, if that facilities are uh, destroyed, then what would happen? I mean, we, we had the debate already 10, 15 years ago. Iran would would uh, uh, might uh, uh, leave the NPT, and uh, depending on the internal internal politics, governments might argue. Now we need really a nuclear weapon program. We have been attacked again. We tried for 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 a very long time. So I think it's it's utmost important that there's a way. To, to reactivate and uh, the the um, the JCPOA, but this is of course very complicated, and this will be subject for the next one two years, um, and and hopefully it can there can be very can be done results between the Biden administration with the Rouhani uh, people, uh, hopefully maybe in a secret way and to come to results so that it, it has an effect for the June elections. If not, uh, we also have a problem, you know, Germany is much closer to Iran, Turkey is much closer to Iran than the United States is. So it's, it's our utmost uh, important for us really to, 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 to solve that it not, cannot be fully solved because there are always voices saying, you know, there might be a clandestine program. But this is also true for other countries, for example, for Saudi Arabia. And I'm, although I'm a German, I mean, this is also the case for North Korea, Israel, India and Pakistan. And although these states have to be confronted what what their future plans are. Sorry for about the long, long answer. Not at all. Thank you very much for a very informative um, uh, exposition on this. So we have about um, 17 minutes or so left and uh, quite a few hands up. I myself have a couple of questions, but I'm going to go to uh, the participants. So first I have Volkan Imamolo, um, and then there were a couple of other people who uh, even sent me questions in chat, so I will read them for them. But first I'm going to go to Volkan, who's one of our PhD students. 
Uh, hello, first of all. Hi, Volkan. Hi, thank you for your uh, presentation. It was very, very informing for us. Uh, I have a question on regarding on the future of nuclear stockpile, the future of disarmament. You know, you mentioned that there's a positive trend that, you know, the numbers of nuclear warheads is decreasing over the years. And now we have the Treaty of the Provision of Nuclear Weapons in force. But I want to ask that, can we see a return in terms of increase of nuclear weapons that is either because of, you know, emergence of new nuclear states such as Iran and, you know, subsequent withdrawals of NPT, or maybe caused by an incre increased intense rivalry between already nuclear states, for example, such as China and United States. So because of this, despite having uh, now the you know, new treaty, uh, can we see any increase uh, in terms of nuclear warheads and stockpiles? I think this is uh, indeed, uh, thank you for that important question. Um, I think it's, it's very clear if states like Iran or North Korea are again under maximum pressure um, to use this Trump term, then they will react and they build, might build nuclear weapons. Um, so it's, it's not unlikely. And if that happens in the Middle East, then the question is what, what does other states like Turkey and Saudi Arabia do? Uh, they feel, you know, uh, playing an important role in the region. I do not know much details, but uh, that's for sure. So this is a non-proliferation problem, and um, we can also extend that to North Korea and to Japan and to China. Uh, there are always triangles here. The problem is nuclear deterrence is easy, can easily be understood between three, two states, whether it works or not. But you know, if you have three states, things are really becoming complicated. It's uh, you know, I made my PhD in mathematics, and I can assure you that game theory of two players is very different from game players with, uh, with uh, by uh, game theoretic matrices with three players. You know, you, you might have seen the, the movie, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. There's at the end, not a duel, but not three people <laughs> in a duel. <laughs> That's, you know, it gives you too many options here. Uh, what happens in, in, in a case of conflict? So um, the question is, of course, is China uh, 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 multiplying its, its stockpile? Uh, the U.S. says, yes, they are doing it. They are not very transparent, but if you look to my, my uh, arms control association um, uh, diagram, we still assume that this is not a heavy, heavy increase, but they, you know, by including uh, MIRFs, multiple independent re-entry vehicle, it could happen. And that is also a reaction on, on, on missile defense, you know, that's a typical reaction here. Yeah? Uh, could happen. Uh, so it would be good to have China in the arms control dialogue. I don't say that they will be part of New START uh, soon, but, uh, but that includes also, if you speak with Russians, also UK and France, and then you are in the, in the, in the same debate. Uh, whether uh, Russia and, and, and the US uh, are building new warheads, it's an interesting technical question. Uh, they have enough, in a sense, so they can rebuild warheads. And this is actually what they are doing. They use the material and uh, they are uh, producing some new systems. You can discuss there as a warhead W6076, whether that is a new one or not. I wouldn't say it's a new one because they simply have too much. Um, I think that's it. And, 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 uh, but the danger is always there. And, and it has much to do about also about the performance of the warhead, but this is a very technical debate and uh, yeah, maybe another time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I had a hand from Edge Solmaz. I don't know if she's still here. Uh, maybe maybe she's, she's had to leave. Um, and then Denis Oruch. Uh, may I go on? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nonek. That was a really beneficial uh, presentation for us. Uh, my question is not exclusively on the nuclear side, but in general, I'm curious about your opinion as a German scholar. Uh, Chancellor Merkel's uh, office is ending this year. And what does this mean for both Germany and the European Union perspective? 
That's a good question. <laughs> you know, uh, Angela Merkel uh, ruled for 16 years and I think most of the Germans uh, never, at least the younger ones, had a different uh, political feeling than her uh, term. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a little bit like with COVID. I mean, there will be processes which have been put on the shelf will will come back again. Uh, we face the debate about NATO. Uh, so I, I only speak about foreign policy here, but COVID, for example, is also part of foreign policy. So <laughs> the next question is, how does a new chancellor uh, handle uh, uh, also our internal uh, crisis? I mean, each country has a problem here uh, and, and different health system, different, different strategies for vaccination. Um, we, we simply don't know. I, because we don't know who will be the really the, the serious challenger here. It's not yet clear uh, who will become the successor of, of, of Angela Merkel. And it, it's really simply the, the elections are in September and the time is so volatile, uh, also in terms of the EU, for example. But I, I, I would say German politics will, of course, change after such a long time. And um, the uh, successors might have different priorities, but I don't think that this will turn in some kind of anti-European uh, 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 policy. Uh, most of the even the challenges are pro um, pro uh, the EU, and, and Germany is aware about its its um, uh, responsibility within the EU. EU, and I'm, I'm sure that um, with France, there will be still a strong connection here. Uh, the transatlantists will be there. And uh, of course, it will be interesting to see what happens with other, with, with, with the Middle East, with also with Turkey. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, that, that could, could might uh, change things. Nord Stream is a problem. I don't know. I mean, there's not a, much debate, but it, it will increase. And we will have in elections. And then you can ask me again then. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question from uh, Gök Kalk, um, Elatmas, who asked me, so wrote the question to me and asked me to, uh, to, to pose it to you. He says, uh, even though we have the Paris Initiative on the topic of renewable energy, many countries did not keep their promise. What did we learn from the NPT that we can implement on this issue of climate change and renewables? Yeah, <laughs> good question. Um, I think uh, cl climate change is not so controversial, at least not in, in, in Germany and, and most of the governments, including the Biden administrations, wanted to go forward here. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to do because each country has different uh, energy needs, energy consumptions and um, and is is affected by by future climate change, so I think the, your your question is really what do or do treaty mean and the implementation of implementation of treaties uh, uh, mean in the twenty first century? Uh, are they still powerful? <sighs> I. I'm happy to leave that really to the social scientists to study the, this this precarious balance between norms and reality and um, what to do with it. I think uh, after after four years of Trump and and understanding that that, that that the problem is not only Trump that there are a lot of objections also in specific countries. Popular we call that populism, but this term is also not quite good to understand really what's going on here. Um, is, is a big challenge for treaties. Uh, we simply have to show, and that includes NPT, JCPOA, New START, and all the treaties which are gone, to, to, to substitute them by, by better agreements. And that means a major diplomatic offense here. And I, I could imagine in the US, at least, the pendulum goes now in the right direction. That does not mean that the pendulum would, would, would be a full swing in the other direction. That's very unlikely. So let me let me 
leave that in this uh, quite um, diffuse uh, uh, symbol. <laughs> And I'm Thank happy you. to leave that to the social sciences to study that, and I'm happy to read that. Wonderful. Um, I, I have a question, or actually a couple of questions of my own. Uh, on one of your slides, you discussed the idea of uh, denuclearizing, and, and then you uh, juxtaposed that with the whole, um, the, the, the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, and that, that we, we would denuclearize, then that doesn't mean that we would eliminate commercial nuclear energy. And it's not uh, terribly easy to go for, from a peaceful nuclear pro, uh, program, especially if one has only uh, reactors, to a military one. But it's definitely easier to do so if a country has the full nuclear fuel cycle, which is, as you said, uh, covered and, and allowed under Article 4 of the NPT. So when we talk about denuclearizing, we mostly talk about removing nuclear weapons, but then we are also allowing for this residual capability to maybe go back to it or, or advance. So the kind of verification mechanism you thought, you proposed, or you, you discussed that we'd have to be created for the ban treaty to be operational, would they just let the commercial nuclear energy part to the IAEA? Would they work together with the uh, with the IAEA on this, or would they assume? Would they uh, uh, take upon themselves these additional verification steps that would ensure that those facilities are used only for civilian peaceful purposes and not for military ones? This is this is of course also an important question. Um, you know, I'm I'm much more active. Uh, in the in the step by step world uh, of of, of cre concrete diplomacy than in the visionary world, um, although uh, Pakwash and others started really uh, with that kind of vision, and at the end you have to bring together vision and 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 reality. So we, <laughs> since we are still on the same path, although it looks a little bit different, I think we have different different uh, phases here. And I mean, the last phase uh, for a world of free of nuclear weapons would mean that the state and all states have given up nuclear warheads, that they have given up maybe the production facilities because if they don't have to produce weapon related material if they don't need nuclear weapons. And if you can make sure that there are no clandestine programs, which is also hard stuff, then the, the question is remaining what to do with the um, the then existing uh, nuclear um, facilities, commercial facilities. I, I would say first, if the NPT is still valid, then it works. Not perfect, but it works. So states, there are many states which are, have no really interest in that, but they have interest in, in energy needs and. Um, so it depends also what really the status of the NPT and IAE is at that moment of history, where I have doubts whether I will be eyewitness of it. So because it's, the progress is very slow here, and and um, so IAEA has produced a lot of good people, knowledge, protocols. So it it can be adopted to other treaties, and um, um, I think. Nevertheless, uh, uh, you touch, in a sense, a, a problem which is very often not studied by international relations, uh, which is the sanctioning of states uh, if they violate treaties. And um, of course, you need to have evidence that this has happened. I mean, it, sanctions are happening with Iran, for example. But uh, what does it mean in a world free of nuclear weapons with commercial facilities and a full-fledged a nuclear uh, full cycle. Maybe we don't need a full-fledged nuclear cycle any, any longer, but it depends then on a on a sober analysis of the situation. If if this situation uh, really happens, and uh, I think then I would simply argue that we need then a fissile material control treaty, not cutoff treaty, control treaty. Because there are still huge, huge, huge amounts of um, the fissile material which is related to nuclear weapons, which can be related to nuclear weapons, especially in the states which are on the forefront of it, and that that by chance are 
the nuclear weapon states, uh, but it's also Germany, for example. We have also a stockpile, but this is under Euratom. And so we don't have direct access, but in the case of crisis, we could have access. So we have to build more and more barriers here. And um, I think uh, new, new treaties have to include that. It's, it's utmost important, but for the moment, I think the, the highest demand is really to enter a world where we have high confidence that nuclear weapons really have been dismantled or that at least the material is no longer available. I think that would be still uh, a, an important step forward. So I, I cannot, cannot answer that question uh, in a full way, uh, 100% because it depends on, on the situation we have, if this situation really uh, happens, but you have to be prepared on that situation. I think that this is what we should not uh, underestimate here. Great, thank you very, very much. Uh, we are right on time. This is, it's two o'clock, which is uh, really, I, we don't know how time went by so fast. That's, that's my reaction. I think this is a, one of those situations where when you're having fun, time flies by. Yeah, uh, true. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's probably not uh, an appropriate expression to say that we were having fun, but we are learning. We've learned so much from you. And for that, we are uh, truly grateful. Uh, I would say uh, this was one of the most informative sessions our students can get on the topic of verification and disarmament. Uh, and so for that, uh, I would actually like to um, start a round of applause. I'm sure people are applauding in their in their rooms wherever they are, but we can also use uh, emojis if we are afraid of, of loud sounds. Um, Professor Noinek, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for giving us uh, your thoughts on truly essential and pressing and timely issues. We hope to read more from you in the future, so please send us anything that you consider would be helpful for our students to continue informing themselves uh, on this issue. We're going to forward them the materials that you may have in mind. And we really hope that not too far from now, not too late, where you're going to come and visit us in person in Ankara. Do you allow me a last word? Of course. Um, I'm happy to send you my, my transparencies. No problem with that. Uh, first, you can have a look on the Packwash uh, homepage. Um, you can have a look on the homepage of IPNDV. I have totally forgotten to say that this initiative is, is of course, uh, sponsor, was, was triggered by the United States and is run by uh, the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And they have uh, created a portal where you find a lot of material on it. So everyone who wants to study that in detail can, can find uh, graphics, can find uh, protocols, uh, pictures, and so on. So uh, I would uh, encourage you to, to, to look on that. And uh, I wish you for your studies uh, a lot of luck. Uh, I hope uh, you stay committed to these very important foreign policy uh, things. And of course, I'm happy to come one day to, to Ankara on the tracks of my ancestors and to talk with you in, in person, no doubt about it. And maybe we, we can organize a Pugwash meeting. Uh, Mr. Kira Goblu, for example, is a Pugwash, Turkish Pugwash colleague. And I would be happy if younger people also uh, take part uh, in the activities in, in, in Turkey. So good, good luck for you. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope you can proceed with your studies uh, uh, in a successful way. Thank you, Professor Neunek. Great to see you. Thank you again for your talk. Thank you, everyone, okay. for coming. Have a okay. great day. Stay safe. Yes. You too. You too. Bye-bye.